just a quick amount. I'm Michelle. And I'm Lucy. Welcome to Tudor River Is, the biographical podcast that examines lives in the Tudor era. And today, Thomas Stanley, part two. Part part, two. Is it part two, part three? I'm not sure. You were going to fiddle about with the timings. Uh, I think I'm going to leave it as two, because that was a good break. And when I went back through it, I couldn't separate it into three where it made sense to cut it off. So it's just going to be two very long ones. Okay. People can pause and come back to it later. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Or just just sit there and plough through the whole thing, the whole six or seven hours or whatever it's going to be in one go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We ended with the death of Edward the Fourth in 1483. Mm. Dun, dun, dun. Mm. The country had been settled for a little while. Things were getting back on track. They were no longer in, well, they were still in debt, but Edward was doing a great job in getting us out of debt, getting proper taxes, all those wonderful things that everybody hates, (laughs) but is very necessary. (laughs) But here we go again. We now have Richard. Mm -hmm. So Richard took the prince from the Woodvilles. And this is where I started disliking him because he decides to stay on the side of Richard. Oh, right. I thought you meant disliking Richard. I thought I seem to remember you oh, mentioning no. on, on several occasions that you don't like <laughs> I can't Richard. Stand Richard. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Richard Society. Yeah. I just don't like him. Everything I've read about him, the state papers, everything is just. I don't know. It was like he was doing really well up until this point, and then he just plummeted. His first parliament passed a lot of very good laws, including yes. the right to bail. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, I mean, who knows if he hadn't, if it hadn't been for the princes in the tower, he might have gone on to be one of our great kings, who passing Possibly. lots of really good legislation. Possibly, it's one of those what if, what <laughs> ifs. But then we wouldn't have had the Tudors, and then no Tudoriferous. So, and he'd already gone downhill at that point. So the princes had to have not existed at all for him to have been a good king. Yeah. I think. <laughs> So that's a huge what if. <laughs> There's a lot of things that had to not happen before he even existed. Mm. Well, having having upset all the Ricardians in the country, <laughs> plow on. <laughs> ah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I started disliking Thomas because he was an executor of the king's will, of King Edward's will. And he should have protested Richard's actions. He had gone to the side where he was being very legitimate and following the rules and being such a good, upstanding man to letting Richard take the boys, put them under custody. And he even became friends with Richard. There's lots of mentions in letters, personal letters, about the two of them spending a lot of time together hunting and just having a great time and and doing what friends do. And uh, it made me wonder, what happened to your loyalty to King Edward and his boys? Like, I know having a a boy on the throne is Mm. not the best, but a council was supposed to be ruling. Yeah. And there are plenty of examples. Sorry, go ahead. I was just thinking, they must have all looked at it in a different way. They must have all bought into the fact that Richard said that the boys were bastards or thought at this time it's too dangerous to have a boy on the throne or they can't have just accepted oh oh he was going to oh oh, you are now fine that's okay whatever i don't care who's on the throne they can't have just had to have been discussions yes and it must have seemed logical to them unless richard was just filling their pockets (laughs) i did not find anything Mm. showing that he was bribing Mm. thomas stanley at all I really it must have don't. seemed logical to him in some it way. It had to have. 
I'd like to, no, I'd like to think it did. I don't want to sit here thinking this is the best we're going to get. So this is where we're going for, mm-hmm. because I think we can get more out of it just because he's been so upstanding up till now. And that seems really conniving. Hmm. So I'm having trouble reconciling that. But it's very, so, I'm trying to think of anybody who actually stood up against it. It must have seemed the only Impossible. possibility. Yes, and we do have to keep in mind that at the beginning, when Richard took the boys, he was acting as a protectorate. Mm. His laws were good. He was scheduling the coronation. Everything seemed to be going well. And we can't say who knew what Richard's plans were. Because people were caught by surprise when he hauled out. Oh, why can I not remember his name? Hastings? The one that he... Hastings and beheaded him. Mm. Everybody was stunned. Yes. All of the mentions of it are that people sat there with basically stunned faces, mouths open, like, what the heck is going on, to the point where nobody could take action. It, it was legal, so apparently. I, I always assumed it was very much... Um, oh, Illegal. Dear. Why can't we... Why can't we think of words today? Well, just... Um, Rough justice, in a way. I thought I thought he yeah. was just dragged out instantly. Apparently, there was a trial of sorts, really, with Richard, and apparently that was all that was required. I don't know whether it was but it, that meant just Richard saying he's guilty, and that that counted as the trial. But apparently, it was legal. It just wasn't moral, <laughs> and that's why people were charged upset him with about. witchcraft, didn't he? I can't remember now. I Maybe just I just came across in a book I was reading just now that said that because huh. Richard was the protector, he was able, presumably, just to say this man is guilty, and then that made it legal. Wow. Mm. I mean, if anybody knows differently, please write in please and say. Please let us but, know. But that's yes. what, that's what I literally just read just a few minutes ago. I've never read that. That's yeah. really interesting. So even then, we can't say that he went off his rocker and just, mm. he did it without any sort of jurisprudence. He seems mm. to have known what he was doing. Huh. Mm. I love when we stop and we're just <laughs> thinking. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm thinking, I did read that right, didn't I? <laughs> yes. Yes. I'm thinking that would make more sense as to why people were willing to continue with him for a- after that action, mm. if there was some sort of legitimacy to it, yeah, but I okay. think people still thought it was wrong. Yeah, it was just wasn't legally wrong. It was just morally wrong. Okay. What we do have from the accounts is that Richard and the Duke of Buckingham did these plans in private meetings at Crosby Place, which is Richard's home. And I couldn't find any time that they were meeting that Thomas was even in the area. So it is possible that he had absolutely no idea. Mm. It's one of those, I really love this guy. He's a great friend of mine, but there's no way he's going to back me on this. (laughs) So we'll just, why don't you go hunting or take care of Lancashire? Run along. And we'll, yes, (laughs) we'll deal with this later (laughs) and it'll be all done. We're not talking about anything important. Nothing, nothing's going to happen while you're not here. Don't you worry. Yes, yes, we will put everything on pause. Hmm. I do know that there is a huge amount of speculation about Thomas's thoughts during this chaotic time, but it is all speculation. Remember, Thomas did not agree with using emotion. It's almost Hmm. like robot mode kicked in and I'm just going to witness everything and hold my mouth, hold my, hold my mouth, hold my (laughs) tongue until we get to the point where I know exactly where it's going. Hmm. That's their, their modus operandi, wasn't it, the Stanley? Yes, it was. <laughs> Very and sensible. Since, what I do like is just how good he was at this, because there are letters from him and not a word is said about what's going on. <laughs> not one iota. So we can assume, or I'm I'm going to make the leap that we can assume that our amount of knowledge of what he was thinking is the same as the amount of knowledge of everybody at that time period knew. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and even his closest friends, probably. <laughs> yes, I'm thinking probably the only one who might have known was William. Mm. Yes, because they must have discussed a lot of things together just to have kept up this 
double act, really, isn't it? Yes. Mm. Yes. Because you can't just all of a sudden tell somebody to do something. They often want to know why. Mm. Why? Who? <laughs> when? How? And with how quickly they acted together, it seems like they didn't have time to do that at the moment. So they must have been mm. chattering back and forth. So I'm thinking William might have known, but obviously nobody else did. Not even Margaret Tudor. Mm. She had no idea. And I can see that in her machinations in the background because <laughs> she's doing stuff that's totally against what Thomas ends up doing. <laughs> okay, you don't talk to your wife. Yeah, okay. I was going to You're say, we're going anyway. to remind everybody that, yes, that is, that is the wife. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret Beaufort. <laughs> the only thing we can say for certain is that Thomas was acting against the Woodvilles. And that, I think that, that was enough for many people, wasn't it? Yes. Mm. Nobody liked the Woodvilles. No. I can't find anybody who argues in their defense during this time. Mm. Yeah. They had no allies. Mm. The other thing we do know is that Richard also thought of him as a threat. They were friends, but Richard didn't include him, as I said. Mm. He didn't include him, and he didn't include him until after everything was completely done, which makes me think that Richard didn't trust him enough to bring him into those schemes, which therefore makes him somewhat of a threat. That He sort of brought this on himself, really, hasn't he, by always standing back and waiting to see what happens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I let you stand back I and wait. trust him. <laughs> no. No, I would neither. Some claim that Thomas was on the side of Richard the entire scheme, but others claim that Thomas and Hastings were actually scheming together to take the Regency themselves. And then you get a third group that claim Thomas was only interested in crowning Edward V and maintaining the protectorate and following the noble path. Hmm. I can't find any confirmation <laughs> of any of those three. Frustrating, isn't it? Because they, but, you're, you're given three things which are sort of diametrically opposed and you've got to, yes. you've got to choose one. And uh, the people who argue each one of those are very good at arguing their logic. And mm. each one made sense. It was like, oh, yeah, I totally get that. Get to the next one. Uh-oh. Mm. <laughs> that also makes sense. Yeah. We, hmm, I don't know, but. Now that I've got a different view of Polydor Virgil, Polydor 100% stood behind Thomas wanting to maintain the protectorate as the executor of the will, stating legal documents that I can't find. Again, we're in that situation where they could have existed yeah. and they've just been lost. And Polydor was contemporary, so he may have had that answer. He wasn't and, always right, though, was he? <laughs> no, he wasn't. But he also wasn't biased mm. with Thomas. If you read through Polydor, he's at this point still very friendly towards Henry VII, but he's not friendly to all of Henry VII's supporters. Mm. So I'm not sure if it's Thomas Stanley's relationship to Henry's mother that saves him from Polydor being nasty, or if he actually has documentation that we don't now saying that Thomas was an honorable man just wanting to maintain the protectorate. I really want to think that one. Mm. <laughs> I don't want to think that everybody we do is just a horrible person. <laughs> uh, when Richard did make his move and killed Hastings without a trial, Thomas was also physically attacked. Mm. Again, this is why we think he's a, a threat. He was hit on the head with an axe. Oh, blimey. And apparently it glanced off because he was turning. Even so, glancing so off that, with an axe sounds painful. Yes. Well, he was under the table unconscious. Mm. So he has no idea what happened. And it could be the fact the only reason he survived was because he was under the table unconscious and bleeding that everybody thought he was dead. So he wasn't actually killed during the whole kerfuffle. And that tells you just how chaotic that moment was. It wasn't just people going, oh, my God. It was people were being attacked. Mm. We think that because he looked dead, that's why he survived. So the axe blow glanced off rather than digging in his head, and it actually was them trying to put it dead center. But even then, while he was unconscious, 
Richard had him taken and imprisoned in the tower. Do we know who hit him? We don't. Mm. Chaos. Everybody thinks everybody else did it. <laughs> well, be the one with the axe, I should imagine. <laughs> There were many, apparently. There was quite a group that came in with Richard attacking specific people, and Thomas was one of them. So that would have been murder. murder. Mm. So much for Hastings yeah. being legal. <laughs> yeah. I didn't want to ruin this part. <laughs> but still assault. <laughs> yes. The only reason Thomas appears to have survived is that Thomas had a powerful family. If Richard had killed him... Because of his gathering of Lancashire, Chester, and yeah. having William still out there, Richard would have immediately started a civil war. It would have started right back up again. Thomas was too strong for him to kill him outright after this. Uh, I'm just thinking, because I didn't know about this bit, and I'm just wondering how on earth Richard thought that Thomas would s support him at Bosworth when he's arranged to have him hit over the head with an axe. <laughs> See, and this is where that first group said that he was with Richard the entire way on the scheme, mm. say that this attack was an accident. Right. And that's why he wasn't killed after they realized he wasn't dead. But he was still taken to the tower. And imprisoned, yeah. yeah. So then their claim is, no, 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 that was Richard going, oops, we've really hurt you, we need to make sure you're under proper care. And we're going to keep you in the tower just so I can apologize to you and say this wasn't my intention. You just got caught up in the fray. And that's where that argument starts sort of for me going, oh, no, I'm, I'm not paying attention to this argument. Well, I suppose you think in the tower, it sounds, yes, it sounds dour and stony and drippy and things, doesn't it? Whereas there were some lovely places, yeah, in the tower. Yes, the king's so, apartments are there, and, and Henry... That was the closest place, maybe? Except he was imprisoned. Yeah. He couldn't go anywhere. He had guards. That, that, ruin, that ruins everything, doesn't it, really? Yeah. <laughs> he was paying for some other criminal to be his servant while he was there. So, yeah, not, mm. not a guest. That made me go, yeah, no, Richard, he was not on Richard's side. So we're down to he was just waiting and seeing, or he actually did want to do the protectorate. Yeah. But again, why did Richard think that this was, that he'd, he'd say, oh, well, let bygones be bygones. I don't mind being hit over the head with an axe. Yeah. <laughs> I'll support you. I don't know. Oh. I really don't know. All we can th say is that obviously Richard had a rethink about Thomas and imprisoned him rather than executing him. Because he could have said the same claim against Hastings, against Thomas, and mm. taken Thomas out at the same time. Hastings didn't have the same gathering of power, manpower mm. specifically, that Thomas did. It's easier for him to get rid of Hastings than it is to get rid of Thomas. And having the whole bit down through Lancashire and the Welsh marches... If anybody yeah. wants to come into England, hello, and Tom come Thomas on in. just says, "Yep, yep, yeah, no problem. We're not going to stop you. No, here we'll even help you out along the way. Did you need fodder for your horses? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Essentially, Thomas became a hostage. After Richard claimed the throne, there's a great deal of confusion about when Thomas was released from the tower and the part he played." We do know that he had to play a part in order for Richard to look any way at all legitimate. Thomas has been the steward of the household. He's Lord High of the Marches. If he doesn't support Richard, Richard has no chance whatsoever. And I didn't realize Thomas had that much power. Mm. But he had built himself up that way. If Richard doesn't get Thomas on his side, he is screwed. And if he decides to take out Thomas, William is staying very far away in safety. Mm. And might be in contact with anybody. Correct. And this is one of those things where I get a little snippet of William that I'm not sure if you got. It was regarding the coronation, how William was stood off because he was just as strong a character as Thomas. So if Thomas something went wrong with Thomas... Thomas was 100% confident in his younger brother taking over the family and maintaining that family. Mm. So now we know that William's just as smart, 
just as iron-willed, and just as willing to stand back and wait and see. Oh, yes. So he's got that patience. That's an amazing family trait to have in two people. Yes, they must have sat down and discussed the, the, the policies. They must have said, okay, this is going to work best. On this circumstances, yeah. I'll stand back, you go in. On this circumstances, we'll both stand back. Or in this circumstances, vice- I'll go on that side, you go on that side. Yes. They've got it absolutely sussed. Yes. Mm. When you look later at, say, Thomas Howard, Thomas Howard was a dictator to his family. You do this, you do this, you do this, don't ever question me. The more I read about these two was more like it was a perfect partnership. Mm. Yeah, I got and that they're... impression from the other side that... Perfect. They, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> You've got two people that are just the most perfect people to be working together. They almost think exactly the same. And they're so successful at it, too. Mm. Very. Yeah. Yeah. And they get away with it. And you think, yeah. why have they got away with it? Because surely if one if one succeeds, the other one must fail. But somehow... And they don't. The, the family carries on. Yes. Mm. Strength to strength. Richard has no choice. He brings Thomas out of imprisonment, starts giving him even more honors, even more positions, even more power trying to buy him. Too little too late, I would hope. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. But we also know that Thomas is very good at taking all that in and still sitting and waiting and seeing. Mm. Thomas's sons were still out in the north in Wales and could bring a huge force to bear on Richard that Richard could not survive. He had alienated the majority of the English by his actions and especially the disappearances of the princes. That hinges on everything. Anyway, I'm quite looking forward to getting on to Henry VIII and we can leave the princes behind us. Because <laughs> <laughs> you don't get anywhere with them, do you? You just you get to a certain point and then you say, but we don't know what happened. So Yes. <laughs> yeah. I wish we did. I wish they'd do genetic testing on the two that they buried, thinking Mm. they're the princes. If they were smothered, they might not be able to find anything. But if they were Mm. killed in any other way, there might be... Come on, King Charles. Yeah, he wants it. Queen Elizabeth wouldn't do it. He wants... Apparently, he wants to do it. Not himself, but he's he's keen to have it done. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, let's figure this out. Thomas had decided at this point to choose life. He gave in and sided with Richard after everything had been done, but only after he had extracted as much as he possibly could out of Richard for honors, money, and more land. It was either accepted or die, but I think it was quite clever. It's one of those, I'm going to come over to you once you get to this point so you don't think that I'm just doing it to save my life and I'm going to turn on you later. Mm. I'm going to do it to the point where you think you've honestly bought me and I'm now loyal. I've noticed that with a lot of people who are bought. Yeah, you must resent it. Yes. You must resent doing the buying and the selling, really, I think. Yeah. Mm. I don't think that's ever going to turn into, hey, we're friends now. No. Richard went one step further and made Thomas a Knight of the Garter. Mm -mm. Yeah, so now he's personally loyal to Richard through that order and has sworn all the oaths. I think Richard thinks this is going to top it off. You know, you've just sworn an oath over holy relics to be loyal to me and only to me. Now we're safe. But no, Richard didn't. (laughs) Didn't think that. He ensured that Buckingham was in charge. Fatal mistake. Mm, (laughs) Retained more power than Thomas. (laughs) Yes, you think, okay, I don't trust this one, but I definitely trust this one. I'm going with this one. Oops. <laughs> Thomas and Margaret were at the coronation and in court. From some historians' point of view, they were forced, but we'll never be sure. It was a public show of the fact that Richard was in control. In the pageantry, it was also made clear in public where Stanley raided in the regime. Mm. He was put in place both below Buckingham and particularly Thomas Howard. Mm. Somebody of a lower rank than Thomas Stanley. So it's a slap in the face, but it's also a very public view of who you should be going to if you want to retain favor of the king. That's one of the reasons these pageants and these processions were done. Thomas Howard had more money, I think, didn't he? They were were a richer family, but obviously not 
noble yet. Not yes. Yet. Merchants. They were merchants, Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> merchants. <laughs> Don't say that. Some of our best Patreons are merchants. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm thinking I don't understand why the Tudors felt that way. Yeah. Why was noble bloodline everything? Well, did they? Because they took on quite a few commoners, didn't they? The, oh, they every... did. They did feel that way. A lot of the commoners that they took on were women to gain the money of the family of the merchant. And that woman was not treated very well. Well, I was thinking more of, well, they weren't merchants, but um, Dudley and Empson weren't, you know, were quite low down on the pecking order. And they were hated. And they, yeah, they were hated. <laughs> and, and of course, Cromwell and Wolsey. Hated. hated yeah, hated. they were all hated, yes. <laughs> but they did take them on. <laughs> Those guys were kind of, we have no choice. Mm. I'm not sure how Thomas Howard oh, you mean, managed oh, to Oh, you get... mean the, not the monarchs themselves felt like that? No, I mean the nobility. Yes. Oh, well, yes, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Even now you get the term, oh, your new money. Mm. Old money versus new money, and new money is dirty somehow. And old money I don't think exists. These people living in massive stately homes <laughs> with water <laughs> dripping through the roof. <laughs> Man, if I ever become a billionaire, I'm so buying and living one of those houses. Could you imagine the quilting room I could have in the great library? <laughs> I'd buy Montague at house. And if anyone's not seen Montacute House, then Google it and you'll see it's the most beautiful house in the world. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I just don't want to clean it. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> uh, before Richard, Thomas Stanley led Buckingham, even though Buckingham was a duke, and Thomas Howard in the procession. And now that's been reversed. Mm. And the reason he went ahead of Buckingham was apparently because Buckingham was a bishop or a cardinal. Apparently he requested to be moved down one, even though he was a duke, he should have been in the front, for humility as a <laughs> churchman. I thought you were going to say because he was using his church title rather than his secular title. No, it was humility. humility. It's like, oh, um, bless him. Wolsey rode a mule or a donkey. Hmm. To show humility. They weren't humble. No. <laughs> anyway. No. <laughs> <laughs> so now both of them have been deliberately put in front of him. Thomas was made to keep close to Richard for over a year. And this is an interesting statement in Tudor England. Keeping someone close can mean two things. They're with you at all times or they're under guard. Right. You keep close. Elizabeth I was kept close when she was under guard. Mm. So I don't know which one that was. It's hard to say. With Elizabeth, you find her jailers named. You don't find that with Thomas Stanley. Although, if you don't trust somebody, you don't want them that close, do you? I mean, physically close. I don't know if you have to keep them. Yeah, you don't want them stabbing you in the back. No. Or, hey, hitting you with an axe over there. Yes. yes. <laughs> now you see how it feels. The Croyland Chronicle, which if you get a chance to read it, it's online, it's great, mm. states that Thomas was still being held up to Richard's preparations for, to fight off Henry Tudor in 1485. So he, they imply that he was under guard. This seems absolutely crazy now, because having read about William, which we'll hear about next time, and Thomas, uh, how Richard could have possibly thought that either of them would be on his side? He thought it because he had their sons. Yeah. Well, he had Hostages. Thomas's son. Thomas's son. Yeah. Yes. But, hmm. I would have thought there's so much resentment. <laughs> My next bullet point. Mm. Why on earth would Richard mm. let him call his military? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah. What I love through all of this is that Richard is only holding on to and watching the men. Again. Fatal mistake. Yep. Margaret Beaufort's yes. off running around doing her own thing. Yep. And Elizabeth Wood, Wood. I still want to call her Woodpile Woodville. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And they're conspiring with Buckingham, another Beaufort line. So he's focusing on the one guy that probably would have stayed out of it. <laughs> Margaret did as she pleased. And boy, did she. Mm. <laughs> we can... If people are joining us now, go back and listen to the Margaret Beaufort episode for her part in this, because it is quite involved. We can see again Thomas playing both sides. He did not come to the aid of his wife's conspiracy. 
No. Possibly because he didn't have an opportunity if he was being kept no. close. But also he, stayed... he and his wife might be doing the same as he did with William, that you go yes. on that side, I'll go on this side, and somehow we'll we'll be all right. Yes, mm. exactly. He stayed with Richard, and it could have been because he was almost killed when Richard took the throne, and he was directly under the control of Richard for why he stayed out of it. Or it could just be that they were playing both sides again. His family, uh, this is me making an assumption. His family also didn't join in on that conspiracy. And I think it's because Thomas was being held as a hostage. Mm. You can't join her. She has an opportunity to get out of this because she's a woman. But if we do join, then we might lose Thomas. And the two brothers never seem to be willing to actually put each other's lives at risk. Mm. It was one thing to put your goods up for, I don't know what you call that. Why am I having so many problems with words this year? <laughs> well, risking the att attainder, yeah. Yeah, rather than being executed. We also know in this particular conspiracy, Thomas would still have been healing from the head wound. <laughs> so he may just not have been quite with it yet. If you've had a severe concussion. I'm trying concussion. to imagine what a <laughs> glancing blow with an axe would do to your head. Mm. It bled profusely, but every cut to a head does. Yeah. There's lots of veins in your scalp. But if it's a glancing blow, definitely concussion because he was unconscious. Mm. Possibly a broken skull. Possible brain damage. There's been people with massive concussions that have ended up struggling with things. Mm. It doesn't seem like it, but it does take a while for your brain to heal. I know people who have been hit on the back of the head where the occipital lobe is, where your eyes run can go temporarily blind and go blind until the bruising and swelling goes away mm. thomas and his son george came to the aid of richard but allowed his wife to continue the conspiracy he pretended he didn't know what she was doing which is quite a dangerous move because i should imagine people at that time would have complete contempt for you if you didn't know what your wife was doing and she yeah. was running around town organizing a conspiracy <laughs> I'm not so sure. There are quite a number of very strong women that we run into mm. that their husbands are not thought of contemptuously. Margaret is one. Uh, Bess of Hardwick is another. Mm. Um, why can I not think of her name? She's Henry VIII's time, very end. Lettuce Knowles is another. Mm. Yeah. So it is possible. Usually noble women. Yeah. Thomas and his family, including Margaret, of course, weathered this storm, and it seems that it was both Thomas having his son and brother support the king, as well as Richard's own personal prejudice that a mere woman could not have been the source of the rebellion that saved her life. <laughs> a handy bit of misogyny there. <laughs> yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for thinking I'm done. Margaret was punished very mildly. I won't go too far into it because we did in her episode, but her properties were transferred to her husband rather than being taken by the king. Mm. And this seems to be an actual reward for Thomas staying loyal to Richard. Even, okay. yeah, it just seems bizarre that he's not, he's not say, saying to Thomas, why did you let your wife organize a rebellion? Yes. <laughs> Women are stupid. Mm. So are kings, by the sound of it. <laughs> yes. Thomas, once again, was the premier power in the North. The titles or offices that he was not originally given automatically, the steward of the North, when Richard took over, was now given back to him. And I suppose Richard has to be careful in the North because that is his power base. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want yes, to is. antagonize anybody else who's... In the north. Yes, which makes me go back to episode one where Richard's power in the north was taken away and given to Thomas and Richard hated him for it. Oh, uh, yeah. But I was just thinking that Richard would, wouldn't want to sort of split the north. Right. Um, into having to choose a faction because he needs them. Yes. Especially because there's a certain amount of disquiet in the south. Yes, mm. a certain amount. <laughs> Thomas was still in no way secure. The old guard were mostly gone and new upstarts had risen and there, 
they were more trusted than the Stanleys in the court and in Richard's household. Hmm. He was replacing people that he couldn't be sure of. We have records of Thomas bribing one of the upstarts to keep him happy with Thomas and to help him with requests to Richard because Richard was had such animosity towards him. So we know it was not a comfortable household to be in for Thomas and Richard. And it's something he never had to do in the previous two reigns. Hmm. Even though he was back and forth on sides, he never had to bribe to retain influence. He wasn't in a completely bad position, finally, with Richard when things started to seem settled, but it was in no way secure. There's, he just can't be secure in that. He and his son George were part of the commission that arranged a truce with Scotland through a royal marriage, which is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Makes you seem like you're in the in the upper echelons. Richard also made the mistake of continually giving offices and power to the Stanley brothers in the north. So he kept increasing their power to keep them sweet. Which reduced his own power, and I don't know if he realized that. Yeah. Yes, and you're you're just creating a bigger and bigger thing to come and bite you later. Yes, and putting them together. Hmm. Why not separate the two brothers, put one in the south and one in the north? But he didn't. They were now generals, and the troops in the north were more loyal to the Stanley family than they were to a king who had just killed two young boys, or supposedly killed two young boys. And the Stanleys also held much sway in Wales. Remember, yeah. they weren't just the lords there. They were really working to make sure that those people were well cared for. Low rents, they helped them with subsidies. If they lost everything, they then helped them rebuild. They were really good at keeping people loyal on their side by treating them well. Mm. So here we have Thomas, a man who, by the actions of Richard, had been badly wounded, imprisoned, demoted publicly, and had absolutely no reason to be loyal. Quite the opposite. Others were given lands and titles in this area of influence in Lancashire, trying to reduce his monopoly of the area that was only reversed when those men had been granted that power died in a rebellion. So Thomas had been eking away at his power. They rebel, and now they're all dead. Mm. He's got nobody to give it to except for Thomas. So I'm taking it away, and now I'm giving it back to you. Are you going to be grateful? No. (laughs) You're going to be still ticked that he took it away from you in the first place. Yes. Richard just seems to be making all the wrong moves. Hmm. With Thomas, anyway. Hmm. And in such a short time. He's not on the throne for very long, is he? No. No. In 1485, Thomas possibly had a better alternative to Richard. Oh, who's that? His stepson. I think it's a guy named Henry, maybe? Henry? Henry. Could be Henry. No. Not ringing any bells, no. (laughs) (laughs) If Henry was on the throne, Thomas and his family would not only be safe, he was a stepfather. There would be larger gains for him and his family, and they would also rank above all others in the kingdom. And also, Henry hadn't hit him over the head with an axe. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. (laughs) I'll keep going back to that. I really wish we knew if that was an accident. Mm. <laughs> I think even even so, you'd you'd be thinking, be angry. <laughs> was it an accident? Was it? Yes. Mm. Thomas began to conspire, but with his usual hedging, he invited several into the conspiracy, which is unique. Most of the conspiracies were fairly tight knit, mm. with only a few people. But he had his entire family to bring in. But he also then turned to Elizabeth of York, Sir John Savage, Sir Gilbert Talbot, and a number of men in Wales that they weren't named. They were just prominent men in Wales, apparently, which is sad. Like, you don't even think they're worthy of being named. (laughs) But he must have been sure of them. Yes, you'd have to be. Mm. They would not outright change sides. What they were planning on doing is bide their time, and if Henry managed to arrive, they would watch the battle. They would choose at the very last possible moment, so that Richard had no way to prepare. So they'd planned not to fight at Bosworth. Well, they didn't know about it would be Bosworth, but they'd planned not to, not to fight right back at this time. 
Yes, not to join the battle until the very last moment. Yes, everything else has failed against the rebellions against Richard. I have quite a successful history. Let's do it my way. So, yeah, I, I had also assumed that they were playing it by ear before I started reading about William as well. They were playing it by ear at Bosworth and then thought, OK, Henry's winning. We're going in with him. But they'd obviously decided this a long, long before. Yes. Yeah, I, I was of the same opinion. I always thought it was at the very last possible moment. They said, you know what? Let's do this. Mm. No, they knew exactly what they were intending to do. That's fascinating. I had no idea. Yeah. Wow. And the fact that he managed to get other people to agree to do the same. So a lot of these people, like the men in Wales, were going to, all they were supposed to do was be a blockade. Hmm. If more of Richard's forces come, just don't let them through. Just get in the way. Yeah. You don't even have to fight them. Just be slow in front of them. Hmm. You can see quite clearly that the Stanleys were still not in a great position and insecure within Richard's reign when we find that while Richard sent Thomas off to gather his military to fight Henry's invasion, he demanded that Thomas's favorite son, George, stay with him as a hostage mm. to ensure Thomas's and his brother's good behavior. Thomas, it seems, continued to play both sides to ensure that no matter who run, his family would be on top. He told Henry that his son was a hostage, but also told Henry to fight Richard as soon as possible after he landed. He was telling him, you can't move farther into England. That way, if things go poorly, he could flee back into Wales and out of England to try again. I've also got the Welshman in position to keep that route open. So he is backing Henry, but in a very weird way at this point. Mm. So there is a way back for him. Yes. If if it, if it all falls to pieces, he can say, no, I've been on your side all along, Richard. Yes. Yes, it wasn't me. It was the Welsh. Mm. The Welsh stopped them. Yep. Yeah. Clever man. Yeah. And this also ensures that Henry doesn't die. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because his wife would have a lot to say about it if Henry were to die. Yes. What is quite tricky is if you look at maps and you read, um, oh, the military historian, I forget his name again. <laughs> his interpretation is, is the reason he said to fight as soon as he came into Wales wasn't just that. It also allowed Thomas more time to decide who was winning and provide him an avenue of choosing at the last possible second to defect if Henry was winning or fight for Richard if Henry was going to fail. And what I mean by that is what we spoke about earlier, how you didn't just gather all of your men in a civil war. It's impossible to gather 20,000 men against 20,000 men and then fight. Hmm. People slowly come in. Thomas would have time to see who actually showed up to aid Richard hmm. if he was farther away. But Thomas knew that they were coming in via Wales, did he? Yes. Even though Richard thought they were coming in through near Southampton? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we gotta think Thomas really doesn't like Richard I wouldn't like Richard so you're going to try to stay on both sides very strategically and you're not going to give Richard any help if something you know he doesn't you just keep your mouth shut mm. I didn't know you have no way to prove that I didn't know things went against Richard in a rather passive way Sounds funny in a battle, but it really was passive. Many of the nobles and men-at-arms did not actively rebel. They didn't choose sides. Mm. They didn't join Richard either. They passively sat back and just let the people who were willing to fight, fight. They stayed out of the battle entirely. They never joined in. They saw. Some of them were there positioned. Yes. Never joined in. No one liked Richard, but they also had no knowledge of who Henry was or whether he would be an improvement on Richard. Hence why, why should I fight for him? Mm. I don't like you, but this guy might be better, but I'm not going to make a decision of which one's wish. No, I mean, he was a completely... Unknown quantity. Unknown quantity, yes. That's the word I was clasping for. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's, what's happened to our lexicons tonight. <laughs> 
Thomas delayed with the claim that he could not come because he had the sweating sickness. Mm. So he actually stayed at home for a while and kept his men with him. And that's where we learned that the sweating sickness was around before Henry turned up with his soldiers. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. This ploy failed. George, his son, was caught trying to escape Richard's captivity and confessed to the conspiracy. He was tortured. Yeah. Mm. It's implied. Torture was not legal. Mm. It was not legal in England. So finding records of it are very, very scarce. You had to get a king to sign off on a bunch of things, and that could be held against the king when Parliament was called for requesting more money. So it was quite often done very quietly and unknown. But the state of George later, when he's seen, it definitely implies that he was tortured. Mm. But we don't know how much was known he knew of the conspiracy because his father was in one place and he was in another. Doesn't really matter if you're tortured, does it? How much you know? No. Yeah. So he could have given them incorrect information. Mm. He could have given them proper information. He could have just said anything just to get them to stop. Yeah. Yeah. Even though Richard had George, Thomas still held his forces aloof once he had gathered them and come down to Litchfield. He neither joined Henry or Richard, but waited. Henry was most likely worried, and by the messenger's change of tone every time he sent them to Thomas, it sounds like he's getting a bit more frantic. <laughs> But he had to have faith in Thomas. Without Thomas, he would lose. He loses his ability to escape the country if thing goes, things go wrong. He loses the entire Welsh forces. Yeah. He loses all of the northern forces. He has no choice but just to hope that Thomas is going to stick with him because he's the husband of Henry's mother. Mm. Thomas had told him that he had to appear loyal to Richard until the last po possible second. Richard had brought George to the battle to be executed in sight of his father if his father didn't join him. Yes. To be clear, this is not a I have the hammer and tongs to make another son moment. <laughs> <laughs> or for people not listening to our Patreon, <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, Katarina Sforza saying that I have the uh, the mold to create more. She said, "You can yes. kill my children because I have the mold to create more." <laughs> Tudoriferous Patreon, do you dare? Yes, that was in our recent episode. You really should listen to it. She's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas, it was well aware that he dearly loved George, almost to obsession, some claimed. This was his favorite child. Took him everywhere. Never left him alone. That kind of thing when he was a young boy. George was also incredibly close to his father. It was one of those few times where... That much love is reciprocated between a parent and a child? Yeah, not pushed away, yeah. Yes. It is said by several historians and people at the time, which is kind of unfortunate for the rest of his kids, that George was the only person who Thomas actually loved. Never have a favorite child. <laughs> no. <laughs> and you hear it all through history, don't you? The, it's uh, Juan being... Um, Pope Alexander the Sixth favorite, and then he favorite, got killed. Yes. Then so then oh, it's Cesare. Then, Cesare, case, so. and <laughs> you never hear of Joffrey. No, <laughs> he's just he's, he's there. It's breathing, I think. <laughs> yes, Richard was now risking George's life. It's probably the only thing that would have had Thomas going. Oh my God! Mm. Well, and William as well. I mean, he was he was fond of him too. Yes. A lot of people claim that Thomas was doing this rebellion for increased prestige, wealth, and power, but I really don't agree. Richard already knew he wasn't loyal. George had confessed. How would this turn out if Richard won and retained the crown? Would George still be alive? Mm. He'd confessed. 
At this point, Thomas has to think, if Richard wins, my family is attainted, we've been confessed to a conspiracy and a rebellion, we are going to be executed. Mm. There's only one way they can go, isn't there? Yes. It's almost like, in my in my opinion, Richard torturing and getting that confession from George put the nail in his own coffin. Mm. If he had left it open-ended, he might have been able to come back from this. So again, I think that's another fatal mistake. He made a lot of fatal mistakes. Yeah, I can't see any reason for Thomas or William to side with Richard. No, there's no way they could survive this now. Mm. Not once that confession was out there. Mm. Thomas, with his two other sons, James and Edward, got as close to the battle as he dared at Stoke Golding, and then waited in full view of the two armies that were about to start fighting. Richard had more men and was in a better position than Henry. The battle should have gone to Richard. Thomas and his brother William were on the north side and the south side of the battle. They waited for the battle to start so they could swell Henry's numbers to match Richard if it looked like it would work. They would also then surround Richard's forces once Richard had engaged because they're off to the side. Mm. The two... They can just sweep in from either side and squash him. It was quite clever. If you look at the lines of the way they think the battle went, Henry's lines did not advance. Richard's did. So as he moved forward, that force off to the side is now partially behind him. Yeah. So they can just close the doors behind him. Now you can't retreat. When Thomas didn't move once Richard had engaged in battle, Richard threatened that if he didn't join him immediately, George would be executed. And he ordered the execution. Mm. It was time to play chicken. Yep. George was very lucky. <laughs> yes. Oh, don't very ruin it. Lucky. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Take that bit out. <laughs> so let's look at this from both sides. If Richard carries out his threat that he would immediately turn the Stanleys against him and the entire family and all those loyal to them, which is eradicate Richard, is this a good thing to do? They had been fair and just lords to the people they were in charge of. Those people were not going to side with a king that it was rumored to have killed two boys. Mm. They're going to side was... with the family who looked after them well. Yes. If George was executed, Richard was executing himself. Guaranteed. You're done. Yeah, there's nothing, nothing to hold. No. Thomas and William now. Exactly. I mean, that's the whole point of having a hostage. <laughs> <laughs> Don't yeah. kill him. <laughs> <laughs> he would now end up facing three armies instead of one. But if he let George live, Thomas still may not join him. He still may have three armies instead of one. Yeah, but it's a possible then, but it's a definite yeah. the other way, isn't it? Thomas is absolutely praying and banking on the fact that Richard would not dare kill his son because that would guarantee Richard losing. Mm. Who's going to blink first? We'll never know. We'll never know for sure if Richard decided to kill George. Some claim he didn't because he was too soft-hearted. Some claim that the lords that were loyal persuaded him to wait until after the battle. Still others claim he gave the order, but the battle had already started and there was either not enough opportunity or Richard's cronies decided they could wait until after the battle to see who won. Yeah. <laughs> Very sensible. Yes. If Henry won, they for sure would be executed. And if Richard won, they could always execute George afterwards yeah. and claim there just wasn't an opportunity. It was a battle. Hmm. What we do seem to find is that Richard did order the execution. So... What was he thinking? Yeah, I think <laughs> at that point he had just gone mad. <laughs> George did not end up executed. So the fact that the cronies didn't execute him seems to be the correct answer mm. to that. We can never know just for sure. See. Yeah. Never know 100% for sure which one went, but it, most say that, yes, he did order the execution. The execution just wasn't carried out. Thomas was told the execution was ordered. 
Still didn't move. Did not move to either aid Henry in his pleas or to aid Richard in Richard's commands. Henry and Richard, after losing the volleys of Lucy, blah. Henry and Richard, after losing the volleys of arrows, moved in for hand-to-hand combat. Richard seems to have lost another support. Northumberland's forces that were supposed to support him and were at the rear of his army didn't move. No, and they just waited to see what happened and then turned around and went home. <laughs> yes, but here's another thing. There are mentions that Northumberland had heard of him saying to execute George. Oh, and he just thought, no, that's the last straw. Yeah, you're going after somebody who's not even part of this battle and wasn't part of the conspiracy, apparently. Mm. So that might have been why Northumberland didn't move. There's a lot of mites and maybes. Dispatches at battles are mostly verbal. Some barely things are written down saying, if this happens, do this. If this happens, do this. When you're giving Mm. instructions prior. So it's really hard to eke out what happened. But the fact that he did not move and never did join this fight says that he was definitely not loyal to Richard and would prefer somebody else. And also, with the dispatches being verbal, obviously, once you know who's won, the people are going to change what they said and did to fit the winner. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Thomas now saw that Richard did not have the same amount of men as Henry. Instead of being above Henry, he was slightly less men than Henry because Northumberland's didn't join them. All oh, right. Thomas saw which way the wind was blowing mm. and joined the fight. Did he? I thought he stayed put. I thought nope, it was he William. joined the fight. I thought William he joined was... the fight and Thomas stayed put. No, both oh. of them joined the fight. Oh. And Thomas was in the vanguard, which means he's in the front line mm. with the Earl of Oxford, one of Henry's most loyal nobles. Mm-hmm. Done him. <laughs> yep. <laughs> There is absolutely no way Richard can win as soon as that decision was made. They have now completely surrounded Richard's forces there. They don't even have the opportunity to flee. And Northumberland is still in the background, not moving. So presumably when Richard made his decision to to go to go for Henry on his own. What sort he of knew he was going to die already. He, he knew that there was no way back. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And there's no way he would be kept alive if somebody else took the crown. No. We've learned that over the last little while. Don't yes. keep the prior king alive. He's outnumbered, outflanked. His rear guard is just sitting watching. And his only hope could be to take out Henry himself. If they don't have a king to fight for, mm. that's the only possibility of them stopping the battle. You cut the head off a snake. I'd originally thought this was a mistake because everybody says if he hadn't done this, yeah, Mm. no, no, he was going to (laughs) lose. And the farther we get into the conspiracy and the fact that he was surrounded at this moment, this second in time, there is no other choice for Richard. I'm going to die anyway. You might as well go down all guns blazing. Yes. And everybody says now how brave, how brave he was. So, you know, that's a good Good bit of PR, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Yes. God, that sounded cynical. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, it did. <laughs> Thomas had gambled with the ultimate gamble and won, and was now in view of all of England, of one of the top men in the country, as he was the father in law of the king. The men of York wrote to Thomas requesting his intercedence with the king, and Thomas obliged. He's now father-in-law. Hmm. That's handy. Yes. Henry, being grateful, gave Thomas the highest rank he could. He made Thomas the Earl of Derby and gave him all the lands of anyone who supported Richard in that duchy. Not a few lands. All that was available. (laughs) Henry also confirmed him as chief steward of the north. Thomas would continue getting rewards through Henry's reign. He's he's made it, mm. as long as there aren't any more rebellions. But we're now safe on, secure on the throne. We're good, right? <laughs> oh, no, there won't be any more. I'm just thinking about whether it would cause resentment between, between the two brothers. I don't know. Mm. 
Thomas was part of the commission to organize Henry's coronation. Now he would have to adapt to a new style of government. This is another time where we see that what people were used to during the Wars of the Roses and prior is not what's going to continue, and you never know how people are going to adapt to change. Henry would not trust anyone, and everyone had to yield to him, including Thomas. The nobles would get titles in the court, but Henry's servants, personal servants, would actually do the work. Thomas was over 50 and seems to have been content to have power and name only and decided to enjoy a quieter life. Hmm, Fair enough. Yes. (laughs) You're over 50. (laughs) Do you really want to keep doing all these battles, rebellions, and constant conspiracies? It doesn't appear to have objected to the loss of the liveries. If we remember from Hmm. the very beginning, Henry got rid of the liveries because you're swearing no oaths of loyalty to the nobles. And we just saw how that played out at the Battle of Bosworth. Yeah. Thomas's own men who were wearing his livery went with him instead of the king. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Henry must have been looking at that and thinking, not under my watch, you don't. Yes. It's incredibly dangerous for a king for liveries to be out there Mm. and those oaths of loyalty to noblemen. That does seem a a break between medieval and well, early modern as well, doesn't it? Yes. Mm. Massive break right there. Thomas does not appear to have objected to the replacement of his men of, at arms and his retainers swearing loyalty only to the king rather than himself. So that was an act as well. Part of me wonders if he actually didn't care because he is the father-in-law of the king. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Or if he doesn't care because mm-hmm. he's now 50 and he doesn't need their loyalty, he's not going to be joining in any of these things anymore. Mm. It's really hard to say. People did not expect to live much longer when they're in their 50s. He must have felt safe as father, father, a stepfather of the king as well, mustn't he? I mean, yeah, you can't get any higher. Hmm. Your wife has an amazing amount of input in the ruling of the country. Mm -hmm. You and your wife, although maybe not lovers are definitely respecting each other they were quite friendly they spent a great deal of time together which is surprising Mm. for people who had a vow of chastity (laughs) at the beginning of the marriage yeah it's a it's hard to put your brain into that i suppose he already had quite a few boys didn't he he didn't need more heirs as as a man he could get it elsewhere yeah 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 Yeah, it was fully expected, not just mistresses, but housing your mistress in fancy places, Mm. keeping her and your children. Although we never find mention of any bastards Mm. by Thomas. That might, you just might not recognize them, I don't know. I don't know either. I learned studying Thomas that there was a major change that allowed Henry to enact these changes when previous kings would have been deposed if they had attempted this. A lot of the aristocracy was gone. Through natural attrition, plague, (laughs) disease, (laughs) as well as so many battles and executions through the Wars of the Roses, many had been attainted and their lands and wealth given to the crown. And whoever had the crown had not seen fit to redistribute the majority of that land's wealth or power. Mm -hmm. There were not as many men that felt they had enough power to resist the king in his decisions. For some reason, I had pictured these changes as a result of the force of the will of Henry. But it feels now after reading this and actually going into the military history that it was more a lack of force on the part of the nobles that allowed these changes to occur. Mm. They'd already been emasculated, really, hadn't they? Henry just sort of... yes carried on the the yeah plan. yeah i mean if you had 12 earls for instance who had their own men their own retainers trying to get them to get rid of those retainers would have been a lot more difficult than when you only have 11 noblemen in total mm. i don't actually know if it was 11 i know it was very few the council was almost the entirety of right. whoever was left. 
goodness. Yes. Thomas, the Earl of Surrey, and the Earl of Oxford were the only ones provided a seat on the council that had any power of say in running the country. That is not Thomas Stanley. No. Even then, Henry made it clear that their earlier tactics in previous governments and conspiracies would not be tolerated. He is the king. He is the sole source of power. And again... Thomas Stanley seems to have had no problem with this. We see no protest whatsoever. But I'm wondering if he thinks he has a back channel to that through Margaret. Mm. Yeah, he doesn't need the official positions, does he? He he can no. go through family. Yeah. And he can't go higher. No. You can't become a duke unless you are related to royalty by blood. He's not. He's related through marriage, so Earl is the highest he can go. You also wonder if everybody had just had enough. There has been civil war for now decades, with short periods of somewhat stability. Maybe some of them thought that Henry does seem to be quite a tyrannical leader in some ways, and that's what this country needs, some a really strong hand. Yes, especially if you want the rebellions to stop. Yeah, rather a scary thought. Even if, yes, people do think yeah. like that sometimes. Yes. If you look at every single civil war or any civil war, that final battle that everybody talks about is never the final battle. It's the final large thing that makes the decision of who's actually going to run the country. Mm -hmm. But there are always minor skirmishes and rebellions that last sometimes for decades. After that person has taken the throne, the presidency, whatever it is called, whoever is in power, it's never 100% settled. No. So if you don't have a strong hand, you're going to go back to civil mm. war fairly quickly. Yeah, so I suppose quite a lot of the totalitarian bits that we've criticized him for may have been necessary for the time. Possibly. More than likely. Mm. Still not pleasant, no. but more than likely. If we think about it and you get down to Queen Elizabeth, where she was settled, that wouldn't have happened if he hadn't been so strong. No. Mm. Thomas now reveled in his new position. England knew he was, besides the king, the preeminent man in the country. He was viewed as a successful warrior. And he was in his 50s. He was now considered a wise elder. These men were quite often sources of information. People would go to them for advice. And that's very gratifying for somebody, yeah. I think. It's a very positive position and a very positive view to hold. He worked diligently for Henry to retain this perception, both in others and himself. He was reliable for Henry. He was hardworking. He never missed a parliament meeting. He always argued on the side of Henry in those parliament meetings. He was on the council and was listened to. No man would ever rule Henry or be shown particular favor, but he didn't need that. Mm. He had it knowing it. It was just ingrained. I know I'm in this position. All in the council. Okay, and there's two councils. So there's a council that runs the government, and then there's the household council. He's on the household council. So when I'm saying council, I don't mean government council. All in the council were expected to work in the court of the Star Chamber. That's the court that you go to that the king is hearing your complaint or crime. They would hear court complaints and provide rulings. They would hear the worst cases in the courts, which means treason, murder, robbery, which involved death, etc. Noble offenders could have their cases heard by this court rather than regular courts. He also served in the court of requests. These were civil courts. Court of requests is if somebody thinks this is my house and you think it's your house, that's where we go. Yeah, because it wasn't always documented. No, it wasn't, <laughs> which is yeah. weird. How do you not have a document? Oh, I sold it to them 300 years mm. ago. Okay, where's the title? There's no such thing. <laughs> all of this shows that he was in charge and ahead above all the nobles. They had to come to him for anything. Mm. 
So why bother to battle to get more positions and things? Exactly. Just to have it stated? Do you really need it stated? I don't know. Something that truly shows Henry keeping all these men, including Thomas, in their place is that a land dispute against Thomas, Stanley, was also heard in the Star Chamber Court. Hmm. He won, but (laughs) it still went to the court. He was not in a position to will the court case away. All right. He was constrained by the law, and Henry argued that all men, including the king, were constrained by the law. That's an argument that would be very appealing to people who have gone through such chaos. Mm. I think that's one of the reasons why he was so successful in the beginning. Thomas was also not exempt from the stick Henry used to keep people loyal to the crown. Thomas was required to pay to keep his office, and he was required to answer a writ of quo warranto. No, we've been through that, haven't we? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) If you can't remember, it is a writ demanding that you have to prove you own the land or are entitled to land positions or offices that you have. And if you want more information, go to the Dudley Dudley and Empson episodes. Yes. It was clearly basically a bribe to keep the king happy. We see that Thomas decided to retire within a few years of Henry's reign. He passed many of his duties on to his son, George, which is important to note. Henry let him. He wasn't letting a lot of nobles pass those Mm. honors down to their sons. So that does say that Thomas was trusted. And also, um, Henry might recognize that um, poor George had gone through a lot to get Henry onto the (laughs) the throne. He almost died. And yet, I didn't see, we won't be, we most likely will not be doing George. After going through all this, there is not a lot of information on George. Mm. If we ever get to do George, it will have to be a cameo episode. And there would be more if Henry had rewarded him. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. So this may have been why he let Thomas put all his honors and positions of power to George, because he himself didn't reward him. We can't say. He may have thought he had enough, given that he hadn't actually battled to get it. Like, Yes. um, Although that's kind of a horrible thing to tell somebody. You didn't battle. I was imprisoned. I was in chains. (laughs) I was under death threat. I was tortured, damn it. How does this not count? (laughs) I went through more torture than people do in battle. (laughs) And I suppose the the, um, family link is not so great. Well, I suppose they're stepbrothers, actually. I have to think of it. Stepbrothers. Yeah. 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 Mm. Yeah. Hard to say. I love that Thomas decided to stay close to court, though. He followed it on procession. He basically stayed on the king's payroll because the king was paying for him to enjoy the feasting, socializing, (laughs) celebrations, and everything that was on offer. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, he didn't stay in the day-to-day workings of the government, but he still enjoyed (laughs) everything that happened at court. So I'm going to stick with you. Surprisingly, though, he was still active militarily, so he obviously was unwilling to give up everything. In the rebellion in Lancashire raised by Lord Lovell and the Stafford brothers, Thomas gathered his men. He also sent men to the Battle of Stoke, though he stayed home, but he did go to the Lancashire rebellion in armor. Man, that must have hard. Mm. At that age... It reminds me of the Earl of Oxford, because he continued to wanting to be in the vanguard, even though he was yeah. beyond what they thought was a fighting age. Mm, you can't keep a fighting man down, it seems. No. He was now more of a courtier than a warrior, but he obviously still wanted to relive his younger days. Or maybe he just liked the rush. Maybe he was an maybe adrenaline Maybe he was junkie. incredibly fit and was fine yes. fighting. Yes, that too. Although... I don't know what that would be like. He's been battling most of his life, and I'm thinking of repetitive stress injuries. <laughs> Using that sword when you've got 20, 30 pounds of metal armor on your arm. Mm. Yeah, you feel they would age quickly, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? That's... Yeah. Mm. Your joints would wear out, wouldn't they? Unless you have really good genes. I don't know. I've... 
perhaps we'll have to look into it, or somebody who actually knows about fighting in armour. What does it do to your body? The one historian that I know of is in England, so you might be able to find him easier. Thomas was present and played a prominent role in many of the ceremonies as an elder noble in court was expected to do, and he seemed to thoroughly enjoy himself. Throughout this time, we can find Margaret and Thomas interacting as old and very affectionate friends. I was just about to say, was he at court more often than she was then? Because she sort of only came when Henry was ill, mainly, wasn't she? No, no, no. So we're still at the part before Arthur dies. Oh, right, yes. She's yes, constantly yes, she's at court. Then, yes. Yes, she hasn't left. They spent a lot of time together. They kept separate household in London whenever they wanted a break <laughs> from the court. I don't think I would have enjoyed being at court life. Court life was noisy, no. raucous. It was nonstop. You were expected to do things all the time. So it's not surprising to me that a lot of the nobles would keep houses in London. Mm. For a break from yeah, court. The amount of feasting you can do, surely. <laughs> yes. Yes. We know that they lived in separate houses in London, but it is also interesting that when they weren't at court for these feasts and fun things, they would often have dinner together, so they would visit each other in their homes mm. on a regular basis. They just didn't live together. Yeah. And then a chaste kiss at the end of it, and in, off yeah. in the taxi. <laughs> And they wrote each other constantly. So there obviously was oh. a really good base of affection there. Yeah. Stanley spent much of his retired time in building and improving manners. Mm -hmm. So all of those beautiful works were awesome. He also patronized Cambridge. In fact, the Beaufort and the Stanley's coat of arms can still be found there and in some cases intertwined. Oh. Which you wouldn't expect for two people that... No, didn't intertwine. <laughs> Did your interview? Yeah, <laughs> thank you. That's beautiful. <laughs> Thomas was the godfather to Arthur, Prince of Wales. He was instrumental in the preparation of the coronation for Queen Elizabeth. He had known her since he was a she was a child, and apparently was quite fatherly affectionate with oh. her, and she had the same affection for him. And that's where we find more. I found more about Elizabeth of York and her siblings through Thomas than through Margaret. Apparently, they lived with them for a oh, while. Right. So there was a very good affection between Queen Elizabeth and Margaret going back to when they were children. So she was like a second mother. Mm. It might be why you see that she wasn't resentful of Margaret being so prominent in court. Yeah. I wouldn't resent my mother. No. No. Which gave it more of a, hey, we have an actual family on the throne. I think it was sort of assumed because people think, oh, God, if it were my mother-in-law, I don't think I could stand it. And people are assuming yes. that Elizabeth felt the same. I'm not, I'm not yeah. saying, I quickly like this, I'm not saying <laughs> I wouldn't be able to stand it. I mean, people in general take that attitude. Yes. Well, you have that thought that the mother-in-law is always awful to the bride. Hmm. That seems to be a trope in a lot of comedy. Yeah. But if you were raised partially by this person and you had developed a motherly affection, yeah, yeah it, it could have been that the happy family that they were constantly presenting that historians thought was false actually mm. wasn't, which gave me a bit more hope for how happy this family was and why... Henry VIII was so loving because he did witness his mom and his dad being loving and his grandparents being loving and not as much discord as we would have thought. Mm. I'm going to go with that because we've been so nasty and negative with every <laughs> other episode. This is a happy, fluffy bunnies <laughs> and rainbows episode. <laughs> we'll get complaints. <laughs> yeah, probably. Probably. He rode directly ahead of Queen Elizabeth's litter in the procession, showing just how prominent he was, even though he was no longer active. He then stayed with the royal family for Christmas with Margaret. It's these prominent roles in intimacy with the royal family that, again, makes you think, yeah, they were a family. Mm. Because you don't find other nobles there for Christmas, for those right. family feasts and family dinners and family games. 
From 1488 to 1492, Thomas was part of the commission to raise money to fight France and rescue Anne of Brittany, ah. who is the next Patreon going okay, up. Okay, put the advert in. <laughs> <laughs> Tudoriferous Patreon, whatever it takes to make you happy. They were to join with Maximilian in this venture, as we know, the most reliable man mm -hmm. in history. Yeah, bless him. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas was in London in person in charge of his forces at 57. Doesn't sound much now. No. But then... Sure does for then. Yeah. <laughs> he joined the expedition to France, though he decided not to be a commander at this time. We don't know why. We do know he fought, but he didn't command the forces. I don't know if he didn't want the responsibility mm -hmm. or if somebody else, like the Earl of Oxford, wanted it. Yeah, maybe he thought someone was better. Yes. Plenty of reasons. But again... He did not get upset at the fact that he was not commanding the forces. Maybe it's his choice, yeah. Yeah. Which is nice. You don't see him going, hey, yes. I'm in charge. In 1495, Thomas was quiet during the proceedings against his brother, William. Lucy will cover that affair. All I'm going to say is that we have no record of Thomas's involvement. The only record we do have is that Thomas requested to leave the court at this time to go to his home. Mm. Not surprised. Yeah. Henry attempted to heal the rift of what was going on by giving administration of all of the properties to the family. Then honored Thomas with a royal visit, personal visit, on a progress later that summer. We don't have a record of Thomas being angry with the king for what happened. We cannot say in any way what his personal feelings will. And Lucy will go into what happened with William. Mm. Difficult time, I would have thought. Yes, difficult. Thomas's life after this seems to have been a much more quiet affair. He's now in his 60s. He did complete his duties assiduously. He didn't renege on anything. We know that he entertained the noble servants of Catherine of Aragon shortly before her wedding. Mm -hmm. He sat as a judge on the trial of Sir James Tyrell. Ah. And he also accompanied Margaret Tudor partway to Scotland for her wedding. He attended his last parliament in 1504. He passed away on July 29th, 1504, quietly in his bed. Oh. He had been serving his last well king, Henry, <laughs> yes, faithfully and honorably for 19 years. And was apparently greatly grieved. Henry was greatly grieved at the loss of Thomas. I guess mm. after 19 years, you now finally 100% know you have somebody yes. you can trust. <laughs> yes. <laughs> which, which was a few and far between for Henry. Yes. Yes. So now we rate him. And fibbly. This really is Thomas's round. He spent his entire life dividing his family and playing both sides to ensure his survival through conspiracies. Yes. His final act in the War of the Roses could be argued to be the decisive factor in Henry VII's win, and he made that win by keeping his allegiances secret and on edge until the very last minute, even gambling the life of his favorite son. Mm. If that gamble is an amphiboly, I really don't know what is. I'm, I would go for a 10 with him. Me too. <laughs> I think they've, the two brothers, they found they found a a system that worked. Yes. And they stuck with it. And yes. And it, it worked all the time. Yes. <laughs> Antiperistasis. This is actually bigger than I originally thought. Thomas began as the eldest son to a man who was fairly influential and was eventually given the title of Baron. And then Thomas himself ended up with the title of Earl, which outranks Baron. Being in control of the North to the point that kings had to beware of him, and he gained wealth and power for his, entirely, his entire family at a time when other nobles were being decimated. Mm. 
he managed to constantly keep himself and his family not only on the winning side of almost every change in power in England, but he was willing to split the family actions to ensure that at least one brother was in a position of power and rewarded at each changeover. Mm. So they managed to continually gain first title, then lands, then power, and then ultimately an earldom. And even when one of them did fall, the lands bounced, weren't attainted. They bounced back. Yes. Yeah, quite often the other brother was given the lands that were taken from oh. the brother that was on the wrong, so- wrong side, the, the losing yeah. side this time. Oh. So the family didn't lose anything throughout no. that entire time. It was insanely brilliant. And I say insanely brilliant because how would you think that putting your other sibling on the other side was a good idea? And yet it worked. I know it was done in the Civil War, the English Civil War. You get that quite a lot. But yeah. And they might have looked at this and thought that worked. <laughs> yes. Let's keep going. While he didn't manage too well with Richard, he did survive, which is more than you can say for several others during Richard's reign. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Even though he got hit on the head. Mm. In the end, he came out on top, not only without anyone in the family losing their lands or wealth, but increasing their power through each king. Yeah. It's an- and that is that is extraordinary, isn't it? That yes. you can take opposite sides and just increase the net amount of your power. Yes. Between you. Yes. Mm. And being able to, when one of his brothers ended up on the wrong side, fund them without getting mm. in trouble. So the other brother didn't even lose basically their lifestyle. <laughs> no. No. They worked as a unit when other brothers would have just let the other one fall. It it's awesome. But as far as antiperistasis is concerned, he was he, he was relatively high. I mean he hasn't gone from nothing to to well. No, but he does go from not being titled to being the father in law of the king. Mm. Oh yeah, I'm not saying it's it's nothing. I'm just mm-hmm. yeah. Um I think I'm gonna give him a six because he was okay yeah because yeah he's he's not a, a rags to riches story he's a true relative relative riches to probably quite a lot of riches yes i'm actually going to give him an eight because at any time he could have been executed and he almost yeah. was mm. so yeah okay oh we should say 20 for him fibbly yep. and that's Fourteen. Antiparastasis. Martyrdom. Difficult. To yeah, I was just that's precisely the word I was about to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he spent most of his life working to ensure that someone in his family was always on the willing winning side to protect the rest of the family as well as himself. While he intrigued a lot, it was specifically designed to ensure that the family as a whole survived. Hmm. The only thing I can think of that we can give him for martyrdom is he gambled with his favorite son's life at the very end. And that was quite a gamble. Yes, I mean, that's almost like losing your own life for it. But um, Yeah, tricky. Yeah. It's not martyrdom in the sense of doing something completely altruistic. Yes. He knew he was going to gain from Henry being on the throne. Yes. So I think I'm going to give him a two for the son. Okay. I was going to give him a three just because I can imagine how devastated I would be. It would be horrible, horrible. especially when it's your fault. Yeah. That's five for martyrdom. Beating. We can't say for sure that Thomas was highly religious. It doesn't seem to be. We can see in his accounts that he supported many religious organizations in his territories, monasteries, churches, chapels, that sort of thing, and bequeathed them money to make sure that they continued in perpetuity. But none of his accounts or gifts or payments can be considered extravagant. He seems to have done the absolute minimum expected by his wealth and position. It could be that this is an extension of his economy and thrift, 
but other nobles provided more than he did, and he didn't go into decorating things. So we don't have artists coming in, making them gorgeous to leave us with these beautiful buildings. But I did say he was obsessed and really got into building buildings and improvements, and he did. And it's interesting how he focused on it. We've got the Lady Chapel that everybody focuses. Oh my gosh, it's beautiful. Thomas went for the more pragmatic way to go. He decided to increase or build or improve any structure that had a help for everyone instead of a few. Hmm. Bridges. Hmm. The way bridges were done in Tudor times is a nobleman would build a bridge and then quite often demand rent or a toll to pay them back for that bridge. And then that toll never went away even after the bridge had been paid for. Yeah, we've we've got a toll house in the village. It's fall, oh. fallen down mostly, but it's yeah, right next to the bridge. Yeah. And people there are pictures of the toll tollman from Victorian times, I think. And po- yeah. possibly later. It ended up being sort of a maintenance tax, even though hmm. in some cases at the you'd pay off the bridge and the amount that they got for paying the tolls often ended up being more than what was required for maintenance for a while until inflation showed up yeah hmm. he also building those bridges he did not demand rents for it so he got rid of the rents for bridges that he did not build he paid the rent off entirely hmm. so that people didn't have to pay tolls anymore to encourage economy hmm. he was trying again improving the lot of people in an area where they're under threat which is I think really good for Batim. Yeah. But yes, it is. Yeah. I was thinking more on the lines of Batim being do we know him? We, do we do we still know them now? And mm. I think we do because if anybody knows about the Battle of Bosworth, they know that the Stanley brothers held back and then yes. swept down and took it over and pretty much won the battle. Yes. But there is only one dissertation, a book, on him. There's Mm. a number of articles, but he obviously has not been somebody that people would go out of their way to research, Mm. even though I found him fascinating. And I really enjoyed him. You were lucky to get the dissertation because I've not found anything like (laughs) that for William. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So they're not famous. They're sort of famous as an adjunct to the Battle of They're famous for one thing. So maybe people don't. Don't write dissertations on some on someone who does one thing. Yes. And then seemingly fades fades away. Yeah. But I would say that anybody who knows anything about Rich the Third, Henry, Bosworth, knows the Stanleys. Yes. If you're in Lancashire and Cheshire, it's probably well they're probably well known because they're in every document that you can think of during this time. And historically, they were critical. Again, building the infrastructure. He didn't just build bridges. He built hospitals. He built town halls. He built churches. He basically built everything that a, the community could use mm. and didn't so charge so people he's got for good, it. He's got good team for the time. Yes. People, people around would have heard of him and been thankful to him, I should think. A lot of his buildings got... are still there under the bridges. Mm. Uh, and he's got a good team for now because I think people will have heard of him yeah. if they know anything about the era at all. So I yeah. would go quite high, I think. I would go for a seven. Oh, I was thinking a seven too. All right, good. He's not brilliant. He didn't do a whole bunch. He did uh, do Cambridge, hmm. build parts in Cambridge, but he's not famous. Yeah. Okay, let me share my screen for. Flaunt of flaunt. Flaunt of bleeding flaunt. So here is Thomas Stanley. They look like two entirely different people. The one on the right looks like a uh, a bit battle-hardened. They're separated by 30 years. Yeah, and the one on the left does look like the elder statesman. Mm-hmm. He looks pretty much exactly as you described him. Really. <clears throat> In these two, two personalities as he got yes. older. Yes. He's holding the same thing in his hand in both of them. That's the steward's role. Ah. 
If they were both in color, the one on the left is his chain of office when he's younger, and it's a different chain of office when he's older because he ended up with more power. But the staff of office is what he's holding. The black and white one could be a photograph. It's a really good painting. It is a really good painting. Mm. And I believe it's not actually in paint. I believe it's a charcoal. Oh. Because there is no color version of it. Oh. Yeah. I yeah. love the detail in the buttons. But yeah, same inscrutable face, same... It's a weird setup on the one in the color. In color. He's <laughs> got a sort of rough thing around his neck and he's got his coat tucked onto the top of his ruff, on top yes. of his collar. So he looks almost hunchback. Yes. I thought the same thing. Hmm. I couldn't quite work out what was what was going on to start with. But, yeah. I started wondering with that one. For one, it's the change of the cut of the coat. Hmm. From what I read about fashion at this time, it's actually a fur ruff, so the fur is standing up, so shoulders are quite low in this. Hmm. But still, it made me wonder if wearing armor for all that time started making him crouch. Oh, he got a bit round-shouldered because of it. Yeah. The um, thing in his hat, is that to show he's an earl, like um, yes, Edmund? Yes, it is an ostrich feather. Hmm. Dyed. A dyed ostrich feather. He's wearing quite a lot of rouge, by the look of him. I don't know if they wore makeup. No, I don't, I'm not, not suggesting he is, but that's, that's how the picture comes across, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Quite rosy cheeks. The one, yes, the black and white one. He doesn't look friendly, does he? Mm -mm. He looks, he looks like he's glaring at the camera, saying, "We're just wasting my time." Mm. Like he's sizing you up, kind of thing. Well, I suppose we've got his office steward thing. We've got the ostrich feather, so we've got a bit of yep. we've got the the chains. So it tells yes. us something about him. And it's an obvious likeness. The ears are exactly the same in both. The nose is pretty similar. The mm. eyes are exactly the same. Although he looks a little careworn when he's older, which I suppose is expected. He's been through a mm. lot. Um, I'll give him six, I think, because we've got we've got stuff to to assess his life with. Yes. I'm going with a five because I don't find his symbol. There's not much symbology there that we were hoping for mm. other than the Earl feather. Like none of his beliefs are in there. You don't see the books in the background or any. Interest. No, that's true. Yes. We haven't got any part of his life. Yeah, I'll go with five as well, actually. Yeah. yeah. Six is pushing it. We probably should tell people it's just him with a blank back background. Yes. There's nothing. There's nothing to show what yeah where he lived or what his home was like or anything yeah okay so that is a 5.5 for flaunt to flaunt giving him a total of 58.5 well he did really good no hang on it's a five because we both went for five. Oh, you changed to five yeah so that so gives got... him a total of 58 yep, which 58, is still really good that is good but now the ultimate question is he tutorlicious are they too delicious or what? I'm inclined to go for yes. So am I. I really liked I thought, him. <laughs> I thought I could feel I could feel you urging me to say yes. <laughs> I, I wasn't going to say anything. I, like him or, I don't know whether I like him particularly, but I do admire how he made made this circuitous path through three reigns. Yeah. yeah. Mm. coming out on top and then yes. not once he did get to the ultimate he didn't go power mad he retires mm. and just enjoys life i love that i love that he did it <laughs> yeah now i've yeah interesting man very yay yeah It's too delicious. <laughs> We're having quite a few too deliciouses recently. Yeah, which is funny because we thought originally... We've gone up and down with how we thought this was going to go. At first, we thought everybody we're picking was going to be too delicious because there's a reason why we're picking them. Yeah. And then we and found then... we didn't like them. <laughs> <laughs> no. 
yes, they were horrible. <laughs> yes. And now we're back up to four yeses in a row. That's yeah. awesome. Oh, and what, now what? Oh, I yep. get my next one. <laughs> Take the box, box. Open it. Right, we have got. Oh! Well, this is the first suggestion by a listener. Oh! And it's. I can't remember a thing about her. And I can't. Unfortunately, I can't remember who it was who suggested it because it's quite a long time ago when we started putting all these things in the box. Elizabeth Tilney. Ooh, okay. She's mentioned in several of my books about women during the Tudor era. Ah, well, that's now, handy. Yeah, unless they're all saying exactly the same thing. I yes. haven't read the books yes. yet. <laughs> oh, I'm excited about that. It's nice to stay in England, for one, and to do a noble woman that's not Margaret Beaufort. Yes, and to do one that someone else has suggested. Yes. Because I wouldn't have thought of her. Because I've never heard of her. I've never heard of her. Oh, that is exciting. Awesome. Oh, okay. Mm. I'm happy. Surely good. Good, good, mm -hmm. good. That's the end of our episode on Thomas Stanley. We hope you've enjoyed it and will join us for the next episode on his little brother, William. Yes, William. Thank you for listening. You can find details of the podcast and contact us on... In the meantime, such as we be made of, such we be. If we are true to ourselves, we cannot be false to anyone. Very true. Goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> Just a quick amendment. We found when we started our research that there was not enough information on Elizabeth Tilney to do an episode for her alone. So she will become a cameo episode. And my next episode will be on Bishop Richard Fox. You go there and I'll stay here and we'll both be okay You wait in and I'll stand back and we'll live to fight another day sure to be there for you and you will do the same for me 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 and we'll steer our boat through treacherous times and try not to fall into the sea 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 you fight for them and i'll fight for us and we'll keep the family on top you fight for them and i'll go home and after all we can swap and as we grow rich and as we grow powerful taking all the land we can find 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 with my boy on the throne we can never fail i'm sure we are of the same mind 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 why on earth shouldn't we be of the same mind